Chapter 3 at the Cornflower Farm Part 1 Lightwing was the first to be outside. He stood on the lofty portico of the Hollybury Hall and directed his eyes towards the setting sun, where against the vermilion flush of the skies loomed their destination, the colossal form of the Flintor. It was not far, and yet what tomorrow would bring was anyone's guess. A sense of foreboding hung heavily in the stillness of the air, and keenly it was felt by every living creature. Beyond the Twill Hill, a number of little specks were rising, and after aligning into a V-shaped skein flew towards them. A flock of large white birds winged their way overhead, honking a farewell until they disappeared behind the tall towers of the Hollybury Hall, and their domestic brethren echoed the calls from the ground. The geese are flying south early, observed Lightwing, and turned to his companion. Ashbar, his brow furrowed, was looking north, where ominous darkness pervaded beyond the endless downs. Long ages ago it was a fruitful, fertile area, but now it was the dust land of greyness, and they could see giant columns of inky fumes disgorging from there and drifting to the west, tainting the glorious sunset. And silent they stood, gazing at the fiery orange orb as it plunged steadily, beyond the valley of rocks. And rapid was the fading of the light, as the flaming streaks of mauve and magenta blazed across the golden horizon. Pop interrupted the silence. Ready, my dears? she asked, and climbed into her gaily painted red and yellow cart. By the time they had walked down the sweeping marble steps, Horstail, the estate's groom, came forward from around the corner. He was holding the reins of a high-spirited stallion who was tossing his great mane and cutting the earth with his hoofs in eagerness. The furniture upon him was most exquisitely crafted, and his coat, black as the deepest of nights, played like shot silk, with tints of blue and purple. His birthplace was in the mountains of the land of golden apples, where indigenous wild-flying horses sometimes would have offspring who would not take to the air. Those foes would descend to the plains seeking the elves who loved and prized them as incomparably faithful companions. And this steed had been one of those foals belonging to the race of the winged horses of the Hesperides, and Blue Raven was his name. Elven horses, born from a union of unicorns and Hesperidians, possessed magical qualities of both their parents, being highly intelligent, fiercely loyal and courageous, and swift like the wind, but like the unicorns they would not bear saddles. Golden Mane was such a steed. His lithe, snow-white body was gleaming like silver, and his golden mane, tail and hoofs shone brightly in the setting sun, as unencumbered by any tack, he trotted lively towards the elf, and then, magnificent, he stood next to Lightwing, nudging him gently with his head. It was time to set off. Lightly they leapt upon their mounts and embarked on their journey, as Poppy led the way, in the ornate cart pulled by a good-natured brown pony with a milky blaze. The cornflower farm was just over seven leagues away, as the dove flies, but they had taken the northbound dragon track, instead of cutting nearly half the distance by going cross-country, for Poppy's cart would surely have got into trouble in the fields. No words were exchanged as they followed the road, and nothing chased away the silence, save for the soft footfall of the horse's hoofs, until just before the turn off to the west, which led to the farm, Lightwing, who rode last, halted and addressed them. I have been thinking about Night Gael. I think you should come with us. The others agreed and departed company, Poppy and Ashbow taking the left turn, while the elf continued north towards the Twill Hill, darkly silhouetted ahead. He held his brother's image in his thoughts, calling to him with urgency, and the silver star on his forehead began to pulse with violet glow. On reaching the foot of the hill, his mount pranced impatiently, while Lightwing watched the two megaliths on the summit. Suddenly there was a dazzling flash of light, and Nightgale appeared between the giant stones astride the white horse with the rainbow tail and mane. In a moment he descended along the spiral path and stood next to his brother, who asked him mischievously. Have I interrupted anything? And then he added more seriously, Come, I shall tell you on the way. They rode side by side, glad to see each other, and their steeds, who were also brothers, being unrestricted by the riders, frisked about to the sound of tinkling bells braided into their manes. Lightwing related the situation in a few words. You have got to come. 
Even under the circumstances, he suppressed a smile, you will be able to understand and remember Ishiel's riddles better than us. Nightgale could not refuse, even though for some while now leaving the Birch Hill for any period of time was disagreeable to him. They urged their courses into a gallop and soon passed the crossroads. Shadows had lengthened in the last rays of the sun, and then had expired altogether, as the day star, red as blood, sunk beyond the western horizon, and then all around them was a shadow. By the time they caught up with the others, just before the gates of the farm, night had fallen, and a myriad of tiny distant suns, one by one, had come out to drizzle their tranquil light upon them. Once they were in the yard, a yawning stable boy emerged from the mews and Poppy was straight away given directions as to the care of the horses, the likes of which have never before been seen at the Cornflower Farm. Even Glen Moss's fine steeds, usually stabled there, seemed plain in comparison. Into the open doorway of the main dwelling a housemaid sauntered. It had not been long since she had left her childhood behind in her native South Broadmeads, in a little village where she had been born and grown up, and where her family still remained. Her pretty face was overspread with a sprinkle of freckles, and her yellow hair was braided into pigtails, and full of wonder were her white eyes with which she had beheld the newly arrived, although her attention was captivated by the riders rather than their mounts. Indeed, she was veritably struck with awe, for she understood that she was in the presence of elves, as back home in Low Paluria she had heard tales and ballads about this wondrous race, describing them as even fairer than the sun itself. She came to the High Twill only four moons ago, and since then had seen many amazing things and persons, but never before had she laid her eyes on such an attractive company. And now, with her mouth slightly ajar, she gaped at them an ash bow, and greeted them with three little curtsies as they walked past her inside. Come on, Buttercup, Poppy disturbed her every get some food on the table. We have very distinguished visitors staying with us tonight. Yes, ma'am, replied the housemaid, and eager to show herself in the best light, hurried into the kitchen, and soon the sounds of clinking and clanking pots and jugs arising from there announced that she was filling plates and bowls with flavoursome fare and putting them onto the table. The elves, I shall call them all the elves, for Captain Ashbow's mother was Altael, Lightwings and Nightgale's sister. His title captain was not of a military origin. It was bestowed on him by the Admiral Plantain after Ashbow single-handedly sailed the brigantine from the land of golden apples across the deep sea. He had been born in the Hesperides, and as a child frequently visited the twill through the portal, which was open in those days. When the duty of the unicorn guardian had been passed on to him from Altael, he decided to sail to his new home. Hundreds of ocean leagues he crossed about Aelil with only his steed Blue Raven for company, and although the winds were always with them, for they had help from the sylphs, the journey was not without danger, and he did have to use his magical Just Sword Rasmi, an infallible example of elvish mastery, and with it he slew the terrible sea monster, who had not only threatened those in the deeps of the briny waters, but had also plagued the dwellers of the coastal areas. He had inherited his father's well-favoured looks, and elven beauty also could not escape him. In fact, Lord Oaken himself used to say, Indeed, Ashbow is the very epitome of tall, dark and handsome. So as the elf sat in the cosy parlour stretching their long legs, Poppy turned to Night Gael. I am very glad that you will be joining your brother and Ashbow. To be sure, everyone will be when they learn this on the morrow. Then addressing them all, we need your elf magic again, and this time perhaps even more than ever. We all know it is crucial to find out as much as possible about the danger that is coming and the nature of the enemy. And we can't be certain that the utterance was about the smoke folk, yet we know nothing about them. It has been but a couple of moons since you have reported their ill-boding appearance in that once fair land. And even the Emerald Kingdom is gone, long gone. Never has there been so much darkness beyond the endless downs. But we know not who they are, or what they're like, not even what they call themselves, and that is a pity, for names can be remarkably revealing. So you must garner from Flint with all the information he has about them. Our very victory may depend on it. She faced Night Girl again, and your legendary remembering power will help you to recall all that you hear. There was a cry. It is already, ma'am! And the housemaid scampered to the open door and stared again at the elves. 
As we're all good friends here, said Poppy, rising from the chair, I hope you do not mind supping in the kitchen. The elves stood up, and stretching their long limbs, they followed Poppy into a warm and welcoming room with a fire crackling in the hearth. Bunches of herbs and garlands of dried apples and mushrooms were hanging down from the beams, and the shelves were laden with all kinds of bottles and jars full of conserves. A hefty table sat in the center, displaying plentiful dishes, and the spaces in between were occupied by flickering candles and little vases with floral posies. Poppy was the last to take a seat and the housemaid, eyeing the elves in turn, began filling the wooden mugs with cider. The repast was delicious. It always is on the twill, made with love and understanding of edible stuffs, for a great deal of special care is taken in food preparation there. All the ingredients are blessed, and the finished dish or drink is potentized with a charm, and this time it was no different, so the evening had flown, as had the cider, and the absorbing conversation. Now, about your sleeping arrangements, said Poppy. You shall have the west-facing room on top, if that is all right with you, Ashbow. He nodded while taking a drink of cider. And you two bright sparks, she began saying to the elves, but was interrupted by Lightwing, smiling his mischievous smile. We'll keep in the hayloft. The housemaid giggled, but Poppy, who had known the elves for a staggeringly long time, matched him with, that is exactly what I was about to propose. In a little while, they were ready to retire to their quarters. Captain Ashbow went up to his room, but although it was well past midnight and the journey on the morrow would begin early, sleep was far from his mind. He knew perfectly well that he had been rather quiet all day, something that the others had also noticed, but he did not know to what exactly to attribute this source of his broodiness. Or did he? However, now was not the time for soul-searching. He and his friends had a task before them, and he could think of nothing better to do than to furbish his sword, which he did absent-mindedly, realizing that, probably, there would be no occasion to use it anyway. Some time later there was a knock at the door, and the housemaid's voice inquired if Sir would like some of their best barley ale. He declined with thanks, and heard her receding footsteps.